it's on me. Do we have sound? All right, because I changed out the batteries and we're good to go. I got some some good ones in there now. So the other ones were really good and lasted a long time. But <clears throat> all right, um, good evening, everybody. Uh, glad you were able to join us tonight on uh, Wednesday night Bible study uh, on Facebook or Pal Talk. Uh, not sure who all's on, but we do re appreciate you all uh, joining us uh, today. Um, we're going to start off in Matthew chapter four. We're going to pick it. We're going to pick back up with Matthew chapter four. Um, but there's uh, one. One announcement that I do want to make uh, this Sunday, um, we're going to have to cancel service this Sunday. Um, we've got to be out of town uh, for a funeral, okay? Um, so we're going to be out of town for that um, through the weekend, and uh, so we're going to have to cancel Sunday morning. And uh, so all I'd say is find somebody good and listen to them. Uh, find somebody better than me which is not hard to do. So uh, um, so get that taken care of, and uh, we'll be back on here next Wednesday, and then we'll pick back up next Sunday. And that reminds me, I need to text a couple people just in case they thought about maybe visiting um, this Sunday so they would know. All right, <clears throat> um, Matthew chapter 4. If you remember, uh, Matthew chapter 4, uh, we just started this. I think this is the fifth, right? The fifth message message that we have on Matthew as we're going through taking a look at the the um, the temptation of Jesus Christ and it's 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 really it's really neat as we're coming down through here we're finding out that there are some things that uh, you know we might not really think of that's actually taking place here and one of the things that we've already talked about in previous messages just to kind of get you all uh, caught back up and get myself caught back up. Uh, from having a miss last week, uh, remember that you've got the three temptations there. And so you've got Jesus Christ is tempted in three different ways. And what it is is Satan uses that, that same pattern that he used against Adam and Eve in the garden, uh, dealing with the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. And we found out, according to 1 John and some other passages, that Jesus Christ... Um, he dealt with the exact same things that you and I do today. Now, he's never had to worry about um, Antifa and, and, you know, you know, am I going to be able to go to the store tomorrow and, you know, all that stuff. But those are, those are, those are kind of ancillary issues, even though they're big issues. They're kind of ancillary because they're a result of people failing the lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. I mean, you look at that stuff, and that's exactly what it is. Uh, you know, Ephesians chapter 2 tells us that this is the course that, 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 that this world is on, uh, that we used to be a part of. This course is now working through the children of disobedience. And so we're not shocked when we look out in the world and see that stuff, right? Um, we, we're not shocked when unsaved people act like unsaved people. And the difference here is how is it that Christ actually deals with those three, lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. Um, and the way that he dealt with every one of them, we've looked at the first two pretty much in depth. And I wanted to, to pick up a couple things as we go through here. But let's start off in, well, let's just read the first 11 verses and we'll get going. All right. Matthew chapter 4, verse 1. Sorry, Ariel. He's going to have to post these on, on Pal Talk, so he gets to post all these. So That's fine. That's fine. Don't worry about it. Um, we talked about, Lila just reminded me, we talked about doing that on, on Facebook that we'd post the verses as we go through, but I don't, I don't know if your phone would allow you to do it as quickly, but don't worry about it. Uh, we'll work on that, though. <clears throat> All right, so Matthew chapter 4, verse 1. Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward and hungered. And when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. 
Then the devil taketh him up into the holy city, and setteth him on a pinnacle of the temple, and saith unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. Jesus said unto him, It is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Again the devil taketh, up in an, in, uh, taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain, and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world, and the glory of them. And he said unto him, All these things will I give thee, if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Then saith Jesus unto him, Get thee hence, Satan. For it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Then the devil leaveth him, and behold, angels came and ministered unto him. Father, we thank you for the opportunity that we had to study your word. As we continue through the, the temptation that Jesus went through and his response to it, may we, may we take a look at that and understand really what's going on there and how we are to respond to the exact same types of um, issues that we see coming on in life, how, how Jesus Christ allowed the Word to be the motivating factor, the final authority, that that's what He rested on. It wasn't the, the thoughts behind the verses or anything like that, or what He thought the verses said, but the actual words themselves. And that is, is the way in which we are to live our lives today, um, the exact same way. Different words, but that's exactly how we're supposed to deal with uh, deal with life is understanding who we are, where we are in your in your word, and allowing your word to be the final authority in all things. As we take a look at this, may we keep that in the forefront of our minds as we continue on uh, living our lives that we might be to the praise and honor and glory of your grace. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. So as we go through here, remember we were talking about what Satan was doing. Not only do you have the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life that's going on there. But you also have something else in the background of what Satan is trying to do um, here. All right? And so one of the things that we talked about is Satan knows that, there, that the three things that he's tempting Christ to do, he's trying to tempt Christ to do something that he knows he's going to do anyway, but he's trying to get him to do it at the wrong time. Right? So then, go real quick, because this is a really good point to, to bring up this, or a good time to bring this up. Um, go to 2 Timothy chapter 2. Um, and, and we've mentioned this before, and I don't want to get too much into this, but, you know, uh, when we go to 2 Timothy chapter 2, um, there's some things that we, we see here. Um, 2 Timothy 2.15 is a verse that a lot of folks... Uh, especially in grace circles, if you want to call it that, grace movement, if you want to call it that. Um, 2 Timothy 2.15 is a verse that a lot of folks quote, <clears throat> and then they try and go do their own little right division stuff, right? Um, you've got some people, they'll say, well, that shouldn't be rightly dividing, but it should be properly handling, and, and you know, those, those come out of, of other versions of the Bible. And uh, some folks will take the, the last three words, the word of truth, or the last four words, and then they'll run over to Ephesians and create their own little doctrine. But if you see what's going on here, notice in verse 15 he says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. But, so he's saying, here's what I want you to do, don't do this, but shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. What is it that he's telling him to make, it, make sure that he knows what's going on He's saying, study, study the word of, word of truth, right, rightly divided. Understand how you're supposed to do that. But shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase to more ungodliness. And so what he does is he's going to give us an example of shunning, of, of profane and vain babblings to shun. All right? So verse 17, he says, And their word will lead as death a canker, of whom Hymenaeus and Philetus, who concerning... The truth have erred, saying that the resurrection is past already and overthrow the faith of some. So when he's telling him to rightly divide the word of truth, he gives him an example of what profane and vain babblings would be of how, to, of how they actually wrongly divide. And so you've got Hymenaeus and Philetus here who 
Notice it says, who concerning the truth have erred, all right? Saying that the resurrection's passed already. So what they're doing is they're taking a biblical truth, right? And of course, we don't have it up here, but what they're doing is they're taking a biblical truth, a truth that is found in Scripture, and they're putting it at the wrong spot in the timeline, all right? And that's exactly what Hymenaeus and Philetus are doing. So what Paul's telling us there in First or Second Timothy 2.15 is, Make sure you put the things in the right spot. And he says, here's how not to do it. Don't do like Hymenaeus and Philetus and say, well, the resurrection, you all think it's over here, but it's already taking place. Right? And what happens is when you do that is what he says there, he says, and overthrow the faith of some. Now, I find it very comforting that he doesn't say and overthrow the faith of all. Right? Because that means that there are people standing against that teaching where somebody is teaching a truth out of Scripture, but they're putting it at the wrong spot. And that's exactly what Satan was doing back here with Christ is saying, I know you're going to do these things, but I'm going to try and get him to do them at the wrong time. And so that's why it's no, no shock when we come to Hymenaeus and Philetus um, who are doing the exact same thing as as Satan did, and we're going to find out probably why is that that, that happened that way. All right? So let's go back to Matthew chapter 4. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 4, and let's, let's take a look a little bit more in depth to this third, um, this third temptation. All right, so we've taken a look at the first two, and that, that second one where Satan actually tries to quote Scripture and he misquotes it and he purposely misquotes it. Uh, we talked about that and how he purposely added some things because that's what he was trying to do. When we get here to, to, to verse 8, uh, this, third, this third installment, if you will, of temptation, um, notice what takes place here. Verse 8. And uh, again, the devil taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain. All right, so there's there's some things there that we should we should take a look at. Uh, go real quick to Luke chapter four. Go over to Luke chapter four, and on your way, uh, something that I just found really interesting. Uh, you know, you think about some things, and go to Luke chapter four, and on your way, stop at Mark chapter one. <clears throat> huh. Yeah, and, and that's the interesting thing about it because, you know, when you think about this, as Delilah pointed out, you know, in verse 8, he says, He taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain. Not just a mountain, not just a high mountain, but an exceeding high mountain, right? And so we're going to talk about really what does that, what does that really have to do with. Uh, Luke chapter 4, <clears throat> notice in Luke chapter 4, uh, Let's take a look at verse verse five, <clears throat> and uh, we 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 see the same thing over there. But there's there's a couple of things here that we see. Luke chapter four verse five, and the devil taking him up into an high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. Now just think about that for a second. Um, think about what Satan just did. He takes Christ up into a high mountain. In in Matthew he tells us it's an exceeding high mountain. And, and I think there's a real good relationship of why it's exceeding high in Matthew and it's only um, a high mountain here. You think about how is it that Christ is presented in Matthew as king, right? So he's taking him to the exceeding high mountain saying, I have this throne. I am ruler over all of this. And you see here, Luke, how is he presented in Luke as a man? And so then when he takes him up, he takes him up to a high mountain, right? And it's something that man can't get all the way up. And, you know, you can go through and talk about things like that. But that's, that's one of those things just kind of jumps in your head. And you're like, oh, okay, that's pretty neat. Uh, but notice, showed him all the kingdom of the world in a moment of time. Now you think about that. <clears throat> in a moment of time, Satan shows him all the kingdoms of the world. Some, you might say, hey, that's pretty powerful. And so 
there, there's a thing that goes along with that, and I, I've got in my notes here, I'll, I'll mention this a little bit later on, but, you know, I, I've, I've been around folks, and they're like, uh, you know, if Satan comes through this door, I'm going to fight him. Buddy, you have no idea. You have no clue who you're dealing with. Um, and you think that you're just going to be able to say, I'm, and, well, I won't get into that. We'll talk about that a little bit later on. But notice, think of the power that he has. He, in a moment of time, shows him all the kingdoms of the world. All right? And in verse 6, And the devil said unto him, All this power. Now, think about what's going on. He's saying, Here's all these kingdoms, and what goes along with these kingdoms is power. He says, All this power will I give thee. Now, you know, you think about you think about really what we're what we're dealing with. Um, and I'm trying not to jump ahead, but it's really hard not to. If you go back to Isaiah chapter 14, and you know, you go through Satan's eye wheels, and the last one he says is, "I will be like the Most High God." And so then you go back to Genesis and you find out what does it mean to be the Most High God. We've talked about this before. It's to be the possessor of heaven and earth, All right? So if you go down through here and read this, and you read the account in Matthew, not once does Jesus Christ say, hold on a second, you don't have control over all these. You're not, you're not, you're not the head over all these. You're not controlling all this stuff. You're not the power of these kingdoms. You don't have the power to give it. Not once does he say that. Now, what we know and understand is because that Jesus Christ just came, he was baptized of John the Baptist. He comes up out of the water straightway, and the Holy Spirit descends like a dove, and you hear God say, what? <clears throat> this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And so the very first attack that Satan does is, if thou art the Son of God. And he's questioning God's authority that he just put on it and saying, if you're really the Son of God, go and, go and, go and do these things. All right. So not once does Jesus say, no, you don't have the power. That belongs to God. And so it's really interesting because we start seeing, we start seeing a, a battle, if you will, between Satan and Jesus Christ. And we'll talk about that a little bit more, so keep that in the back of your mind. But notice, verse 6, And the devil said unto him, All this power will I give thee, and the glory of them, for that is delivered unto me, and to whomever I will, I give it. Now, you stop and think about that for a second. Um, there's, there's something there in this verse, in, in Luke, that we don't get back over in Matthew, and it's this, and it's, it's this right here saying what? And to whomsoever I will. And you're just lucky enough that I've chosen you to give you this power. And, and I've said it before. Satan was the first Calvinist in the Garden of Eden. And that's exactly what he's doing here. He's saying, my will be done. I'm going to, I'm going to run this. I'm going to give the power and the glory to whomever I choose to do so. The only thing he asks in return, verse 7, If thou therefore wilt worship me, all shall be thine. Now you think about, you think about what's going on there. <clears throat> And he's saying, here's all this stuff. It was given to me, and I, I can choose to give it to whomever I want to give it to. No one tells me who I can and cannot give this power and glory to. I'm the one running this. You realize, and we've talked about this before, you realize Satan had never known that God had a plan to reconcile the heavens to himself. And so then when Christ shows up, Satan just wants to keep, make sure that he keeps the, the earth because he's got it all. And so then we keep on going. If you jump over to Mark, this is, you know, when we, when we start thinking about how these books are laid out, 
it's really fascinating because you get to Mark chapter 1, and I told us to go, I told y'all to go over there real quick. Uh, in Mark chapter 1, uh, you start off with the ministry of John the Baptist, and of course, verses 9, 10, and 11, you've got Jesus Christ is baptized. Uh, and again, there we see at the end of verse 11, Thou art my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. By the way, I posted up a series of, of quotes the other day, Part of them were from John Verstegen. Some other ones were some that I that I came up with based off of things that he was saying. Or if you want to put it as a, um, a paraphrase of it. How, how amazing is it to know that you're accepted in the Beloved, the one in whom God is well pleased. We're accepted. Not only are we accepted, but we're made accepted I mean you just you stop and think about that it's just and if God is if God is pleased with Christ then once we get saved he is pleased with Christ in you and I'll tell you what if that if that line wouldn't preach I don't know of any other line that could in fact I gotta write that down <clears throat> I mean you think about that but notice, what I find really interesting here is in Mark chapter 1, Mark presents Jesus as a servant. All right? Notice in Mark chapter 1, verse 12, right after the, 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 the baptism of Jesus. And immediately the Spirit driveth him into the wilderness, and he was there in the wilderness forty days, tempted of Satan, and was with the wild beasts, and the angels ministered unto him. That's it. That's all you get. Why? Because Mark is all about the things that Jesus Christ does. And so then, as we go down through here, we notice that Mark is the only one that doesn't have the genealogy. Some people might say, well, John, well, you know, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and, God, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. That's a pretty good genealogy. Um, but you look here, and Mark doesn't have a genealogy because who cares about the the genealogy of a servant but also when he's tempted he gets two verses in mark chapter one that's it as far as the temptation and it's just and, and you know it's one of those you, you you look at the words and he says and immediately again we've talked about that just go through your bible and just mark out words or underline words that have something to do with time right here it's what and immediately so after the after the, the the baptism, did did they go off and, and have a, a meal and say, well, let's let's celebrate this? No. It says immediately what happens? The Spirit driveth him into the wilderness. What did we read in Matthew? It says he was led of the Spirit. Right? So if if led of the Spirit and he was driven, uh, he was the, the Spirit driveth him into the wilderness. I would say that those two things would probably be synonymous, being led by him and being driven by him. But the issue there, and we talked about it before, is what? It's the Word. It's the Word working in and through him to do that. All right? I, I just wanted to put that out there because it's just kind of fascinating. There's two verses here, and it's kind of like he's, he's tempted. He hung around wild beasts. Angels ministered to him, and let's get on going and do the work. And that's exactly what happens. Yeah. No, I mean, why? Why would you care about the temptation of a servant? Um, so that's a, that's a that's a good point. <clears throat> um, and then 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 what's really interesting? You keep on going in verse verse fourteen, uh, Mark chapter one verse fourteen. It says, "Now after that, so it's let's get on with the program." Now after that, John was put in prison. Jesus came into Galilee. Um, verse sixteen. It says, "Now as he walked by the sea of Galilee." Uh, and you just see him going and doing work. Um, <clears throat> you know the old saying, don't let moss grow under your feet? He didn't. I mean, one, moss probably wouldn't have been able to grow in Galilee and all that. But, I mean, he didn't stand around and wait. He just got to work. And it's, it's really interesting that, that, we, that we see that as we go there. But <clears throat> think about going back to Matthew chapter 4, verse 8. Again, it's, it says, and the devil taking him up into an exceeding high mountain. So what he's doing is he's taking him up to a seat of government of the universe and saying, look down on the earth 
everything you see there. And he did it in, in, a, in a moment of time. And he said, look down on there. All you got to do is just fall down and worship me, and I'll give every bit of it to you. And again, as we said, Jesus Christ never questioned his authority there. He never said, no, you, you don't really have it. And so it's really interesting because <clears throat> he knows that Jesus came to reclaim the earth but he has no idea that Jesus actually is going to also, through his death, reclaim both the heaven and the earth. And that's something that he had no idea about. Um, <clears throat> and so what Satan's going to do is he's going to say, hey, I know that you want this. And, you know, as we go down through here, you know, we've gone through uh, Daniel and we looked at those. And what is it that a mountain is in Scripture? It's it's almost always a kingdom so he's taking him up saying i'm going to take you up into this seat of government this kingdom up here and i'm going to look down and i'm going to say i'm going to give all this to you down here all you got to do is just worship me and that's what satan's after um we looked at we looked at luke that's what he was looking for go back to isaiah 14. <clears throat> isaiah chapter 14 and, and, and we see this over and over again, uh, and it's, it's really interesting. You know, there's, there's this, um, I forget what they call it. It's compliment sandwich. That's what it is. Uh, they'll say, uh, well, if you've got to deliver bad news to somebody, you start off with a compliment. And then you give them the bad news and you say, yeah, but you're a pretty good guy. So you give them a compliment at the end. So you kind of sandwich that. What, what I find interesting is <clears throat> you've got the exact opposite here in, in Isaiah 14. Notice Isaiah 14, verse 12. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which did weaken the nations? Now, if you're Satan, if you're Lucifer, does that sound like a good thing? <laughs> No, and I want you to notice, notice what he says here. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which did weaken the nations? Now, what I find very interesting there is, notice he starts off and says, How art thou fallen, and how art thou cut down? So how is it that he's doing it? Well, continue on. Verse 13. For thou hast said in thine heart. There it is. How is it that Satan was, how is it that Satan had fallen? How is it that he had been cut down to the ground? Because he said in his heart. Notice, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God, which are the angels. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. Do you know what he's saying? I, that throne up there in the third heaven, that's where I'm going to go sit. Notice verse 14. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. We talked about that. Um, real quick, hold your place there. <clears throat> Go over to, uh, go over to Ephesians. Go over to Ephesians real quick. <clears throat> Grab Ephesians chapter one. Grab Ephesians chapter one and grab Colossians chapter one. Now think about where we are. Satan says, look at who I am going to be. I'm going to do these things. I will, I will, I will, I will, I will. All right? Notice <clears throat> Ephesians chapter 1, verse 20. Ephesians 1, verse 20. Which he wrought in Christ, talking about the exceeding, the working of his mighty power. All right? <clears throat> in verse 19. Verse 20. Which he wrought in Christ. When he raised him from the dead, notice, and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places, notice, far above all principalities and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come, and hath put all things, how many things, all things under his feet, and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, by the way, 
that phrase right there, you don't hear about the church which is his body until you get to Paul's epistles. That should probably click something with you, right? Notice, <clears throat> the fullness of him that filleth all in all. I tell you what, you think about this. What is it that God did when, when he used the working of his mighty power, when he raised Christ from the dead? He said, Christ, he says, he says to the Son, I'm going to give you those positions that position of rank and authority, the dominion over all of those things. That's what it means to have something put under your feet, to have dominion over it. Satan was saying in his heart, I'm going to do this. I'm going to go be above the stars of the cloud. I'm going to go be above the stars of God, and I'm going to go, and I'm going to sin. I'm going to do this, and I'm going to go sit in the, the third heaven. And God says to, to Jesus Christ, come. Come. Sit thou at my right hand until I make thy foes thy footstool. You know what he's saying? He's gonna, he says, you, I'm going to come here and, I'm, and one day I'm going to make the foes your footstool. Colossians chapter 1. God gives, God gives the son that position and says, I'm giving it to you. Not because you wanted it, because you willed it. Because this is what we plan to do before the foundation of the world. And Satan had no clue that it was going on. Colossians chapter 1 verse 15. <clears throat> Colossians 1 15. Talking about Jesus Christ who is the image of the invisible God. The firstborn of every creature. For by him were all things created. All right, so we see this and we always kind of feel obligated to stop there and say, okay, what are the all things? He's going to tell us. He's not talking, by the way, he's not talking about Genesis creation. He's talking about prior to Genesis creation. And so what happens is somebody comes along and they say, ah, oh, created. Well, that's Genesis 1. No, that's prior to Genesis 1. Notice, for by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they, be, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things, all those positions were created by him and for him. And notice, he is before all things, and by him all things consist. The fact that those positions exist and consist is because of him. And so the funny thing about it is, not funny, but the amazing thing is, is you can say, you, can, you could almost say, hey, Satan, look, you wanted all these things, but it's by Christ that these things even consist. You were trying to give him things that he created and would not exist had he not existed. And you take that and you cut him down at the knees. And then we're going to see some stuff over in Isaiah 14 when we get back over there. But notice, verse 18, And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence, for it pleased the Father. That's why, that's what, you know, you think about that. He, it says, For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. Do you know what? When we look at that and we understand what's going on there, it pleased the Father that in Him should the fullness of all those positions of rank and authority that consist because of Him, in all those that in Him should all fullness dwell. It pleased the Father that that, that, that was so. And I mean, you go down, you go down through, it's just all kinds of beautiful stuff in Colossians that just kind of, you're just like, man, whew. But go back, uh, go back to Isaiah. But I want us to think about that because, you know, that's not what Satan was thinking about. Satan thought, Satan thought, well, if I can get him killed as a baby through King Herod, then I don't have to worry about him coming and taking possession of the earth. Well, if I can get him to, to tempt him, to prove that he isn't the Son of God, even though he is, if he can fall and if he can fall or falter in one in one point, then then I've got him. 
And we, we, we even looked at the, the genealogy and how God made it possible for the genealogy of Christ to actually lead to him and so that he would be a, a, a seed of Abraham and a seed of David. And, and you look at that stuff and you're thinking, man, that, that's got to be that's got to be something. But here in Isaiah 14, verse verse. Uh, Verse 14, Isaiah 14, 14. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. That's something that God's going to give the Son one day. I will be like the Most High. Verse 15. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. Now you think about that. Satan's like, I'm going to go and I'm going to sit in the Mount of Congregation in the sides of the north and what does the scripture say? No. You're going to be brought down to hell and what? To the sides of the pit. Yeah, like a, a few weeks ago we were driving around and had a, a, a caterpillar on the windshield. And, you know, you've probably seen movies, cartoons, stuff like that, where um, the bugs are on the front of the, the vehicle or something like that, and they're just kind of stuck there. You know, you think about it, like... That's what that's what that's his position now. He's taken down and he's going to be put down. Notice, down to hell to the sides of the pit. Why? And notice, notice verse 16. They that see thee shall narrowly look upon thee and consider thee. Do you know what they're doing? Like, I don't even know who this guy is. I'm not even going to get into the time of day. But people live for him every day right now. You look out in the streets right now, that's who they're living for. Themselves and for their God, Satan. But notice, he says, They that see thee shall narrowly look upon thee and consider thee, saying, Is this the man that made the earth to tremble? That did shake kingdoms? This guy? This is the one? This is the one who did weaken the nations and they're going to say, are you kidding me? This guy. Do you know what the worst thing you can do for a prideful person? Remind them that they're not as big as they think they are. Do you know what this book does? Reminds us that we're not as big as we think we are. And that that to me is 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 really the the main thing here and so what satan does is his main sphere sphere of of in, influence and interest is religion because what's that going to do build you up you know paul talks about the fact that we're not in in romans chapter 3 um well let's finish this up real quick and then we'll get that Verse 17, he says, That made the world as a wilderness and destroyed the cities thereof that opened not the house of, the, of his prisoners. They're going to look and say, That's the one? Uh, real quick, go over to, go over to Matthew. What, what Satan's doing today is his, his, main, his main sphere of influence and interest today is in religion. And what, what religion is all about is if I do these things, then I'm going to get to heaven. If I do these things, then I'm going to have eternal life. If I do these things, then I'm going to have a better second life when I come back as something. And if I've done something bad, I'll come back as a bug and, you know, reincarnation and all that junk. So that's all that religious stuff out there. All that is look at me, look at me, look at me, which reminds me of, of, of Satan, Lucifer, back in, in Isaiah 14, right? I will, I will, I will. Notice in Romans chapter 3, <clears throat> verse 26. To declare, I say at this time, his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. Where is boasting then? You can't ask that in religions. Because what is all religion? Boasting. Do you know what he does here? He says that he might be the ju that he might be just and justifier of, of him which believeth in Jesus. Where is boasting then? It 
is excluded. Boasting is excluded. By what law? Of works? Nay, but by the law of faith. Do you know what faith does? Faith says, I can't do it. And the only response that grace will approve of is faith. Grace will not approve of a work. Because why? It's no longer, it's no longer by grace. Now it's a debt. Romans chapter 4 tells us that. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, right? Everybody knows those verses. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should what? Boast. If you can do something to gain something, then you're going to boast about it. And that's what religion does. And so if we go back to Matthew chapter 4, I skipped all the way back to Haggai. If you go back to Matthew chapter 4, verse 8, isn't that really what Satan's trying to do? As you go down through Matthew chapter 4, we looked at it before. It's on this other page. The first temptation is what? You do it. You turn these, these stones into bread. The second temptation is, okay, you can't do it. Let the Father do it. Let Him bear you up. But the third one is, let me do it. And so you see that progression. But notice <clears throat> verse 8. And again, again, the devil taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. And saith unto him, All these things will I give thee if thou wilt fall down and worship me. All you got to do is worship me. Understand that I will one day go and sit in the throne in the third heaven, in the Mount of Congregation in the sides of the north. I'm going to go there. I'm going to be, I'm going to be exalted. I'm going to, I'm going to do that myself. And all you got to do is just right now understand that that's the way it's going to end and fall down and worship me. That's religion all day long. Now, what's interesting is notice in verse 10. What's Jesus Christ's response? <clears throat> verse 10. Then saith Jesus unto him, notice, Get thee hence, Satan. Do you know what Jesus Christ does right there? This right here is the beginning of the contention between Jesus and Satan. This conflict starts here and goes all the way through Christ's life. And what does Christ do right here? Is he directly rebukes Satan. He says, get thee hence, Satan. Now, it's really fascinating, and I know I say that word a lot, but honestly, it just is. <clears throat> um, real quick, go get, uh, go get Zechariah. <clears throat> go get Zechariah chapter <clears throat> 3. Zechariah chapter 3 because, again, fascinating. I know I use that word a lot, but all this stuff is. Notice in Zechariah chapter 3, verse 1. Zechariah chapter 3, verse 1. And he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord, Notice, and Satan standing at his right hand to resist him. All right, so notice, what do we have here? We've got an angel of the Lord and Satan standing at his right hand to resist him. Notice in verse 2, and the 
Lord said unto Satan. So when we look at this, who is actually speaking to Satan here? Is it the angel of the Lord or is it the Lord? All right. It's the Lord. Notice there that the capital L-O-R-D, who is that? It's Jehovah. So I want you to notice, what do we see here? And the Lord said unto Satan, notice, the Lord rebuke thee, O Satan. Even the Lord that hath chosen Jerusalem rebuke thee. Is not this a brand plucked out of the fire? Think about this. Who is it that rebukes Satan? Is it the angel of the Lord or is it the Lord? It's the Lord. It's Jehovah there. And so what do we see? The Lord Jehovah. And what we see here is that's exactly what we see going on over in Matthew chapter 4 when, when Jesus says, get thee hence. You think about that. Um, real quick, go over to um, go over to Psalm chapter 2. <clears throat> we get Psalm chapter 2. Psalm chapter, Psalm chapter 2, verse 6. Um, also grab... All right, we should have time for this. <clears throat> also grab Acts. Grab Acts chapter 2. <clears throat> And get Jude. I got enough fingers there. <clears throat> so Psalm 2, Acts chapter 2. And Jude chat uh, Jude only one chapter verse 9 <clears throat> so let's start here at Jude right so we should have time to get these and then we'll have to stop here I'll have to make me a note there notice <clears throat> who is it that we see actually rebuked Satan in Zechariah was the Lord not the angel of the Lord in fact notice in Jude verse 9 yet Michael the archangel when contending with the devil he, he disputed about the body of Moses, durst not bring against him a railing accusation, but said, notice, the Lord rebuke thee. So, that you know, when we think about uh, Zechariah, he says, the Lord rebuke thee, not the angel of the Lord. As we see here that even, even Michael, the archangel, could not do it. He says what? He says, the Lord rebuke thee. Now, you find that interesting because who is it that says it? to Satan in Matthew chapter 4 is Christ. It says, Satan, get thee hence, Satan. It's, it's you know, you think about those things and, and you, you start looking at some of these stuff. Uh, Psalm chapter 2. <clears throat> Psalm chapter 2. Verse 6. Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree the Lord hath said unto me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Now, you think about that, and... Uh, exactly what's going on there. Uh, you go over to Acts 13. When is it that he says, when he quotes this, is what? At the resurrection of Christ. So there's something that's taking place there. But notice, go back over to Acts chapter 2. <clears throat> Acts chapter 2. Um, let's start off in... Let's 
start off in verse 32. I just thought of something else. Let's go get this too. <laughs> we got time. Psalm 110. <clears throat> so you got you got Acts chapter two. Grab Psalm 110 as well. So what do we find out in, in Psalm two? Is what <clears throat> he said his king on on the holy hill of Zion, and it says this day have I begotten thee. So we know that that's going to take place. We see that in Acts chapter 13. But notice Psalm 110. And we see this again here. And this is, this is really fascinating. But verse 1, Psalm 110 verse 1. The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou in my right hand until I make thy enemies thy footstool. The Lord shall send the rod of thy strength out of Zion. Rule thou in the midst of thine enemies. Thy people shall be willing in the day of thy power and the beauties of holiness from the womb of the morning. Thou hast the dew of thy youth. And he continues on going down through there talking about the order of Melchizedek. In verse 5 he says, The Lord at thy right hand shall strike through kings in the day of his wrath. He shall judge among the heathen. He shall fill the places with the dead bodies. He shall wound the heads over many countries. He shall drink of the brook and the way. Therefore shall he lift up the head. And you, you go through that and you think about what's going on. What, what we see today going on is nothing like what it's going to be one day. And the best part is, is we're not going to be here seeing this. We're going to be gone. And I, I want you to think about this real quick. And I was thinking about this this week. Notice, in verse 5, he's going to what? Strike through kings in the day of his what? Wrath. What is it that we know, Acts chapter 2, what is it that we know that God's doing today is he's, he's, he's putting forth long-suffering and he's extending to us, as Paul tells us in every one of his epistles, almost every one of his epistles, what? Grace and peace. Now, what's really fascinating is Romans chapter 5 tells us that we have peace with God, but you know, there's another passage, and I want you to go find it, that talks about the fact that we have the peace of God you think about that for a second. <clears throat> and I thought about this this week. If God has peace, and you have the peace that belongs to Him, that He's given us, and so there's, you know, you got all kinds of different things there, but notice, <clears throat> God is at peace. Why aren't we? You think about that. You have the peace of God. And that's different than the peace with God. But it's just, that was the thing that just ran through my mind this week. And it's just, <clears throat> you know, you look out at all the world, God knows what's going to happen. And he's at peace. He knows exactly. He's, he's, it's right on schedule. And if he has peace, why can't we? Because we don't believe the verse that tells us that we do. That's all it is. Acts chapter 2. <clears throat> Again, we see... Peter is quoting what we just read in Psalm 110. And in verse 34 it says, For David is not ascended in the heavens, but he saith unto himself, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand. So what do we see here? We see the Father talk to the Son, saying, Come, sit here at my right hand. The only begotten. We get back over here to Matthew chapter four. <clears throat> who's the who's the person? Can an angel can an angel rebuke Satan? Now, who is it that can rebuke Satan? The Lord. You take that and show a Jehovah's Witness that verse. Think about that. But we get back back over here, Matthew chapter four, <clears throat> verse nine. We'll finish off with this. Verse ten. Then saith Jesus unto him, Get thee hence, Satan. Why? For it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou worship. So then when we go through here, and we talked about this, all the verses that, that Jesus quotes are back in Deuteronomy. You know, that should tell us that we know, we should know 
that Jesus Christ knew exactly where he was. He knew that he was still under the law because he's quoting, he's quoting Deuteronomy, which is the second given of the law. And there are some things that are going on there that we need to make sure and pay attention to. But notice he says, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Um, now, there's a whole bunch of other things that I want to get to, but we're not going to get to tonight that's going off of this. But I wanted to make sure that we see that in Zechariah before we continue on because, you know, you think about what's going on. Um, it's, really, it's really interesting. It really is. So, <clears throat> thank you all for joining us tonight. Facebook on Pow Talk. We greatly appreciate you all joining us. Um, and, we, and, and as we continue on next time, looking at um, really what's going on here. Uh, there's so much here and, and it's just, um, and we're just scratching the surface, honestly. I mean, I, you know, if we were actually spending extra time on this, just imagine, you know, where we'd be. Um, but I do want to thank you all on, on Facebook for joining us. Those that are on Pow Talk, uh, thank you all for joining us. Huh? Sunday? Yeah. Um, and again, I just wanted to remind you all that we won't be, we won't, uh, we won't have our, our service on Sunday. Uh, so we'll meet you back here um, next Wednesday evening. So thank you all and uh, grace and peace. Father, we thank you for the opportunity that we have to study your word. Uh, there's so much in here and uh, there's so little time for us to, to go through here and grasp all the things that you've got in your scripture and the big issue here is knowing that christ allowed the word to to live in him to work through him and the connection between him and the word is such an amazing thing that so many people don't get um, but that's what that's what we see here and all we have to do is by simple faith believe the words on the page that are written specifically to us and about us and allow that to be the final authority in all manners of, of thought, all manners of action, and all manners of walk, <clears throat> that we might be to the praise and honor and glory of your grace. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thank you again, RL. I greatly appreciate it. Uh, you kept up with me really well. <clears throat>